We are now getting close to the end of the beautiful weekend seminar that we have here in Toronto. <coughs> and I think this is the last lecture, and then that's it, concluding the seminar right after. And uh, the lecture, the, this lecture, as the brochure say, is how do I know what's my purpose in life? How do I know? Not how the humanity knows what the purpose of the creation. That's a general thing. How do I know what's my purpose in life? Anybody knows what's his purpose in life here? How can you live all these years religious and not know what your purpose in life doesn't bother you? Huh? Nobody thinks he knows what his I know what's my purpose in life. Well, we know what your purpose is. I know my purpose. No, by me it's easy to know. <laughs> but sometimes it's hard to know. Wait, you never always knew, right? Uh, you're right. It's a good point. <laughs> well, I tell, you, I tell you what it is. The problem with most people is that they don't know what they live in general for. Forget about their unique purpose. They don't really know what they live for. You ask the average uh, secular Jew or, or Goy, what are you living for? He has no idea. To make money, to be successful, to be healthy, to get married and have children, to go on vacation every two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, to eat delicious food. What, is it, what, is it, what are you going to hear? Do you, are you going to hear something really brilliant? Everything is going to tell you applies to chimpanzee. <laughs> Everything. Whatever is going to tell you, the chimpanzee will give you the same answer. I always like to give this uh, parable, I mean analogy, comparison, between the person and a chimpanzee. I said, from a chimpanzee that looks 99.2% like the DNA, like the person. It's almost the same DNA. From a chimpanzee, we can learn about our purpose in life. Why? Everything that is different between us and the chimpanzee, this is the unique purpose of our life. For instance, chimpanzee like female to have relation with them? Yes. That's not our purpose in life, because if that would be the purpose of the creation, we would be chimpanzee, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't have allowed, not allowed, pure, not pure, mikveh, be careful, that. No, it does whatever you want. It's no rules. Many people would love to have such a world, that like you can do whatever you want, and nobody will tell you what to do, and all you do is your physical desires. So that's not the purpose, because if God, the creator of the world, wanted people just to be uh, going from one bed to another, excuse me, so in that case, he would make you a chimpanzee or any other animal, a dog, whatever. So that's not it. So to have a female, to get children, to give birth, also you can be a chimpanzee. You don't need to be a person. And it's much better by them. You don't have to bother 20 years to raise the kid and then in the end he say goodbye and leave you alone and he's ungrateful to you. You don't have it by then. As soon as this little bambi, bambino, the little uh, chimpanzee get up, right away, jump, climb, he's by himself. He's independent. The mother takes care of him a little bit. That's it. They don't, right away, you see, look, they're just born, little ones. Two, three minutes later, they play basketball already in a zoo with a ball. Yeah. Don't have to bother so much. They're raised by itself, no diaper, no changing diaper, no giving them showers, uh, not teaching them how to walk, taking them to the doctor every week, vaccine, checking him. Then one day pay for his yeshiva and then college and this, a million dollar you paid for him. In the end he comes to you and say, Dad, I came to the conclusion I don't want anything to do with you and mom anymore. <laughs> That's your thank you after uh, 20 years you killed yourself. So what is this? So the purpose of life is what? To raise children? No. No, what else? To eat delicious food? You'll be an animal. An animal doesn't have to work five hours before every meal. An average woman, before she makes lunch or dinner, you know how much she works? Let's see. First, she has to work two hours to convince her husband to give her a hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it's already work, right? Then... <laughs> Then, after she finally got the hundred, she rushed to the supermarket and to the vegetable store, 
So she has to go shopping. It's another hour and a half, no? She brings everything home. She carries from the car, snowing, Toronto, stuck in the, in, the, in the snow, all the time snow here. So what's in the end? Four hours, now Baruch Hashem, all the vegetables, the meat, the chicken is all on the marble there in the kitchen top. Now she has to cut the vegetable, clean, rinse, check for worms, this, get cut off the fat, get, find the spices, then she forgot, she runs to the neighbor, she borrow one, this, or run to the store, get me this. Bottom line, six hours, she didn't even start yet. In the end, she finished cooking, people come, yeah, don't like it. I want pizza. That's it. There's <laughs> nothing to eat in this house. I used to drive my mother crazy. Today, when I today, my mother makes the same food she made when I was a teenager. I don't, and I, I love her food so much, but I'm thinking to myself, how didn't I love it when I was 16, 17, that I had to run down to the restaurant every day? What? what, what it's delicious, much better than the restaurant. But I, I don't know, I guess it's a part of, of growing up. That it's the same thing everywhere you go. So bottom line, after that, if they love the meal, which happened once every 20 years, so after that, five, 10 minutes, everybody ate, get up, leave you all the dirt, now she has to clean this, that. Seven hours she worked, just that people will be full for another four or five hours until she has to start from the beginning again. The chimpanzee or the dog, you know, in my house you have the squirrels, they come to the deck. It's, they already know, they have their time. They come, my son throws them all kinds of nuts, this, that, whatever you give them, they eat. Bread, this, that, everything. Then I started to realize that they just, this squirrel just was here two minutes ago. He comes, he takes it, pretends he's eating it, he goes, and then he comes right back. So I said to my son, follow him, see what he's doing. So you see he's going to the trees, to the bushes, we live you know, in a like, forest next to us. He goes, he digs something, he puts it over there, covers it, comes back, he wants more. And again, and again, from morning to night. And they all, they come groups. It started with one, now I have like 13. The whole deck is full of them. But they have very easy life. If I wouldn't give him food, he comes to the garbage, open it up, Chinese, Italian, <laughs> Japanese, Bukharian, whatever you have, every day he's confused, what would I eat? We have one cat in the neighborhood, when he discovered us, it was tiny like this, skinny. You should see how he moved today, like a bear. He cannot walk. In the beginning we thought she's pregnant. Now we realize it's all the food for my garbage. Now I understand why everything is on the, on the driveway. Bottom line, when the dog eats the leftover from your mouth, he doesn't suffer, ugh, germs. He doesn't know what it is. And he doesn't think, look at me so miserable eating from the garbage. He doesn't think, he doesn't suffer. He enjoy very much the leftover, wow. It's a party for him. So the purpose of life is not food. If Hashem wanted you to enjoy food, He would make you one of these animals and you have plenty of food, you eat whatever you want, don't have to cook anything. They enjoy what they eat. That's it, they eat it raw. What do they need to cook? Nothing. So that's not the purpose of life. So in that case, what is it? No, who, who thing he knows? To be educated? No. To get a college degree? Is that the purpose of life? The richest people in the world are uneducated people. <laughs> the Arab sheikhs, they went to university. Some of them don't know how to write their names. But they own all the oil. Many farmers in all kinds of uh, places in America, they got lucky. They, are, they have farms, things, they sell. They never went to school. They didn't finish school. Bakhlad. You know how many Israeli own department store, change of location, they came from Syria, from Israel, from Iran. They own real estate in Manhattan. They're, they cannot hardly write their name in English, some of them, from the old primitive generation. <coughs> yeah. So is it a guarantee that if you're going to spend seven, eight, nine years in college, you're going to have a good job and you'll be wealthy? Most likely not. Because at least 80% of the people who graduate college do not find a job in what they learn. Can't find a job. Lawyers, that. 
it takes them sometimes years until they find a job. And by the time they find a job, they have six, seven years to pay their student loans. By the time they start making money, their grandparents already. <laughs> if they found a job. You know how many of them I know the taxi driver? Went to college and drive a taxi. So you know, I came to the conclusion, I make double. What did they offer me? 40,000 to start? I can't pay tuition to, for two kids with this. So how do I live? I went to college, I killed myself, I owe so much money on my student loan, I'll be a pharmacist, 80,000 a year. Pay the student loan, start the life, cannot make a living, especially in today's economy. Hey, over here it's not as bad, but in New York, it's crushed. Crushed, you have a job, you have to grab it like you grab your life. Because you may not have a job now for three, four years until you find another job. That's what's going on here. So that's not the purpose of life. King Solomon already answered it. Lola chachamim lechem. Wisdom does not bring bread. You can be dumb and be wealthy. You can be brilliant and don't have what to eat. I remember one time my wife's aunt, she married an Israeli guy. A brilliant guy has degrees from the best universities in the world, the best. The best in Israel, the best in America. You see right away, you talk to the person, you see his, comp his head is computer. It's really not a head, it's a computer. <laughs> For three years, I had to lend him money to live. Couldn't find a job. You know why? Why I didn't find a job? And in a good economy, like 12, 15 years ago, in a good economy, when every fool found a job, Every job interview he went, the manager there, right away knew if I hire this guy, three months now he kicked me out of the window. <laughs> I'm like a monkey compared to him. So he said, no, you overqualified. Yeah. You overqualified. <laughs> when he finally found a job, he's making a lot of money. Now, Baruch Hashem is okay. But he had rough years. I, I'm telling you, I'm not lying to you. I had to give him money to buy a crib for one of his baby and a stroller. They couldn't afford. And this is what's going on. You can be a brilliant guy, and a fool like me was supporting him and helping him out. Why? This is the way Hashem wanted, that you have an ear, sometimes the other way around. So money doesn't, education doesn't bring money like most parents constantly tell their children. No. Parents really have to make sure that the, parent, the kids have values. Values. Values can make their life a lot better. Tov, shem, mi, shem, and tov. King Solomon wrote, your name and your reputation is better than the most expensive oil. Oil in those days was something very precious. To make oil, it's all manual. It's very hard to get. That's why if you see that many times Chazal speaking about how difficult it was to have oil or wine, so they give such compliment to someone who make avdala on wine. Every poor person has 10 bottles of wine today in his house. What's the big deal? He buy, pay four bucks, he has two liters of wine. But in that days, you know what it is to make wine, to take the grapes, to clean it, to clean, to do, to wash. It's such a work. It's a lot of work. And to preserve it, that it won't get spoiled, because usually after two, three days, it gets spoiled. You have to know how to do it. It was very difficult. So it's King Solomon say, better your reputation than being wealthy. That's what he really meant. Better to be poor with good name. And today in America, people who have credit, it's better than having money. Credit saved a lot of people now. <laughs> Until maybe one day things will become better, they lift off the credit. If they had good credit, they were paying 7% mortgage, it went down to 4 They saved 3%, it's like 1000 or $2,000 every month they save just because they had good reputation, good clean credit, they pay on time. <laughs> Everyone knows them as honest people, they gave them a loan, half a price modification of the loans. But someone who has bad credit, even 7% he cannot get. Nothing, nobody wants to give him. So sometimes the reputation is more important than having actual money. So that's another thing. So again, going back to our question, who thinks he knows what's the purpose? Yeah. What does it mean to serve Hashem? Explain yourself. So you have to be, Hashem is the customer in a restaurant and you have to be the waiter to serve him? Everything you do has to be I tell you what, I t no, I tell you what the problem with your answer. The first of all, it's incorrect. But I tell you what the problem is with that. The problem with that, you are making Hashem incomplete. 
by saying that we have to serve him, that means he needs something from us. And without that something, he's not perfect. He needs us to make him perfect, and that's kfirah, without realizing. Hashem doesn't need anything from us. What do you think? What was he doing in the world before he created us? For trillions of trillions of years, he was always alone. And one day he decided to create, a, this, to create this world, and he put us here. What did he do before? What is he going to do after? What does he need us for something? The book of Yov, he says clearly, Im chatata ma ta'aselo, im tzadakta ma ta... In other words, I don't remember the exact words, but the pasuk says like this. If you're righteous, what are you doing for Hashem? If you're wicked, what are you doing? You don't have any influence on him. He is perfect with, without you, before you, after you. You don't change him, you do not influence him in any way. So it's really not that. It's not really to say, that's not the purpose. He doesn't need us. Yes, what, yeah. That's the purpose of life, their own spiritual pleasure. Can you show me one person in the world that has spiritual pleasure? I know few, but can you show me from seven billion people? Do you know anyone who really has spiritual pleasure? Don't show me some uh, people who eat kugel and drink whiskey on Shabbat, and they have a big stomach like this, and see, see what Shabbat is great, kugel, great uh, gefilte fish. It's not really serious. What does it really mean, spiritual pleasure? Connecting with Hashem? The angel also have connection to Hashem. Why we need to be people? The angel have connection to Hashem. You're going in a general sense or in an individual sense? I didn't get to the individual yet. I'm still in the general. What? For what? What is it good? Why didn't we become perfect in the day that we are born? Why we have to be deformed, defective, that now we have to improve ourselves seven years? Make a perfect product that doesn't need improvement, right? And he gives us uh, the reward after that. You work on it, and now we get to the reward. You're starting to come to the right direction, yeah? We have to earn our way to Gan Eden. No. Why we're not created in Gan Eden? Because it's like, imagine if you go to somebody's house and you're a guest. So it's one thing to be a guest for a couple of hours. Imagine being a guest for eternity. You feel like a freeloader. So after those people gave us the opportunity... <laughs> Sounds familiar. After those people gave us the opportunity after 120 years, we're not coming as guests into Gan Eden. We're saying, pay up. We did what we had to do. The Bedin Shalmala decided to get in. So we walk in like the self-made man. Yes, but now I'm going back to square one. Why he didn't create us right away in Gan Eden, enjoying from this great pleasure and finished? Because we would have been a yes. We would have had that feeling that we didn't earn it. We would have been there knowing that would have taken away. Hold on. Stop the right there. Being the owner of the house or being a guest makes a difference, yes. right? Hashem would do that. It won't make a difference. So that's a question. I've heard that question before, yeah. Okay. So we're stuck. I have a good answer for it. Oh, okay. I, I, I don't know. I spoke about it this morning, I think, or, or last night. Oh, last night. Yeah, last night, yeah. So, yeah. But we stuck right now. No, so who knows? Anybody knows? <coughs> so, can anybody here raise his hand after all the analyzing that we did here together and tell me why it's better to be a person than not a chimpanzee? <laughs> Show me. Give me one proof. One thing that we are better, that our life is better than the monkey that jump in a jungle somewhere in Africa or in a zoo. Show me one reason why. If you go to the Bronx Zoo, 30 years, you have one lion over there. Two, male and female, both of them very old, laying there like this on a big rock. You walk 20 minutes, wow, a lion. Everyone clap when he makes a move, taking picture as a model. Look, everyone takes pictures, he's famous. Oh, millions of people have his picture. He gets his food all the way to him. He, gets, he doesn't have to work, doesn't have to worry about mortgage, no problem, no surgeries, nothing. Nobody bothers him, doesn't have enemies, no politic, doesn't have to pay a million dollars for his kids' college, nothing. Everything, beautiful life. 99.9% .9 of the millionaires in this world would love to have such life. 
Why they working? You know the joke. I think it was Henry Ford. He saw one fish, fisherman catching fish. So he came to him and said, what are you doing? Why don't you go to work? So the guy said to him, why should I go to work? I like to catch fish, man. So he said to him, no, but if you work, you have money. He said, why do I need money? I have enough what I have. He said, no, if you have money, then you can afford certain things that you don't have. He said, no, I'm pretty fine. He said, no, you will be able to retire. He said, okay, and if I retire, then what? He said, you'll be able to rest and take some time to yourself, and you'll be able to fish. <laughs> and what am I doing, you fool? He got him in a whole circle to square one. This is what I'm doing already. But all these people who work, work workaholic, they have in their mind one day, I'll retire. 90% of them never retire. They go from the office directly to the funeral. <laughs> but many of them, they have that dream. I have an uncle like this. Very, very wealthy man in international standards, but he lives in Israel, but he's wealthy in international standards. In any country you put him, he would be considered wealthy. And he told my father 15 years ago, when I get to 70, I put everything away, I'll go around the world, I give some water to my plants, you know. That's what I'm going to do. You know what he does today, 15 years after the time? He comes to his store, take the door, work like an Arab worker, an average beginner that comes from, uh, from uh, Nazareth and all these places to work by him. He comes 5 o'clock in the morning, he opens the place, he takes, he makes the door very hot, he puts the oven on, he works, he cleans all the pans from the dirt from last night, he puts some oil, this is what he does. He can't stop. He's in it. So one time, I told my father, you don't get one thing here. Him and the Arabs are doing the same job. Why is such a happy man and the Arab is so depressed? <laughs> <laughs> he said, when he goes like this, it's like this. 100, 200, 300, 400. <laughs> the Arabs, one penny, two penny. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> What do you think? He, can't, he cannot stop. He wants to see how his pockets are getting fatter and fatter. Thinking he's going to live forever. You know, Shimon Peres, the president of Israel, is 86 years old. He's thinking one day I'll be the prime minister. <laughs> Telling you, I'm not joking. Still have plans to run again, to, to get elected. <laughs> These kind of people that have career and fame and this, they can't live without it. You know how many singers became drug addicts after they lost their fame? And they killed themselves? As soon as the rating goes down 10, 20 percent, their crisis begins. And, uh, and from now to a complete crash, it could be a matter of weeks. If fame and glory and money would be the purpose of life, why only 1% of the people in the world taste from it? And the rest work very hard to survive. Don't look at New York, Toronto, or some places in Tel Aviv that you still have some wealthy people. Go all over the world, 7 billion people. At least six and a half are almost starving. Go in all over Africa, in villages in Russia, in Poland, in Yugoslavia, in Armenia, in Turkey, in the Muslim world, people still living in the ancient day. Electric they don't have. They have donkeys like, like 500 years ago in some places. Ma, you know how they take showers? They have a little mashpech like this. In Hebrew, we say mashpech. Yes. And they take showers like this with no electric in some little uh, room. And this is today in the 21st century. Go in China, almost 2 billion people. 1% of them are business people, manufacturing. The rest, what they do? Only eat rice from the day they're born until they die. So you don't really see this kind of poverty around here. Even the poor people here are considered multimillionaire in China and some other places. But I promise you that more than 90% of the people in the world are poor and don't have any luxury in their life. So if that was the purpose of the world, Hashem would make us all wealthy. Not, nobody has to worry about money, as much as you want. Like the days of Mashiach. 
So after speaking more than half an hour, we did not reach any progress here. <coughs> nobody, nobody knows what's the purpose of life. <laughs> yes? A little bit louder, remember. It's my honor. What? To be like To be like God? And what is it going to give us? We can pretend we like God, but we're not going to be like God. Hey, I can dream, you know, I, Rabbi, I'm, I feel divine today. <laughs> That's fine, I can dream, no, so. And besides, how do you know that it's the purpose? So really, basically, think about it. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what's the purpose of life. Yes? Character development. Uh, she said it, somebody, I think she said it. And I say, why to develop your character if you can be born with a perfect character? <laughs> why we have to waste time? If you make a, a car, you want the company to make it 80% working and then you have to fix all the things? Or you want it brand new with no problem? You don't want a four Taurus. <laughs> Every week you gotta go to the garage. <laughs> But we have a problem. <laughs> what does the mitzvah give us if anyway we cannot improve Hashem or affect him in any way because he was always perfect? So what do we need it for? What do we need it for? We're not trying to. Okay, now before I give the answer to this, ourselves. before I give the answer to this, yeah. now let's talk about our own purpose in life. There is the general purpose of humanity and there's the individual purpose of each one of us. How does a person know in his life, after following the Torah and devote his life to Torah and mitzvot, ultra, ultra orthodox, how does he know what is my job, my specific job in this world? How does he know? What's the rule? Does any guideline, any explanation? Whatever you find most difficult. <laughs> Very good. 50% of the answer you gave. What's the other 50%? We're making some progress, finally. Oh, Hashem. Now, what's the other half? Improve yourself and try to... to, to uh, improve yourself, that's the purpose of humanity. Every person, Jew, Goy, has to improve themselves as much they, as they can. I'm talking now our individual. One person is a doctor, one person is a rabbi. It's obvious that they don't have the same purpose in life, these two individuals. They both have to keep Shabbat. They both have to work on their midot and improve it. They work have to, you know, on their, 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 their honesty, integrity, all these things. Every person has to, male, female, Jew, goy. The question is, how do I know my direction in life, my purpose? Everybody's purpose is the same. Not everyone's purpose is the same, no. For sure not. No, no. Every, oh, 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 oh. Now, now you're coming very close, no, so? To be the best in your field or in what you do? Okay, so you and him and him together, you give the answer. So let's combine it. What's the most difficult for you to do from all the commandments and correcting your traits? This is your main purpose in life. Sometimes a woman, Shabbat, no problem, Rabbi. Kosher, no problem. What else? Charity, here is a check. No problem. Modesty? No, no, don't tell me this. I can, I know how much I love my jeans. I can, Rabbi, please don't do it. You know, $500 each jeans. So you want me to throw it? I'll do everything. I'll triple the charity. Just let me walk the way I like. Some women, not like that. What's, what do we have to do? Get dressed, dress, no problem. Why, jacket? Okay. What happened? What's the most difficult for you <clears throat> is the main tikkun in your life. Don't run to easy things. Focus on the thing you are very weak. And now, this is what you say, now what they say. Also, every person has a talent. Some more, some less, depend on his job in life. You have to investigate very well your personality and see what you are blessed with naturally and develop it to do holy things with that, to satisfy your creator, to follow your tikkun with what he gave you. For instance, 
Let's say a person, you know, he never learned Torah in his life. One day he finds out that, you know, there is a truth out there. And all he knows is an expert in computers. He doesn't really know anything else. He's not a good cook. He's not, he doesn't know how to drive. He doesn't know how to give lectures. He doesn't know how to make people religious. He doesn't have money. He's a young guy, didn't start his life, but he's an expert in computer. That's his talent. His brain is very good for these electronic things. And there are many kids like this in this generation. Kid like this, what do you think he could do with the talent that he has for computer? How can he translate his talent into billions of mitzvot every hour of his life that he can make? How? He has, he has to use his skills in computer to promote Torah, to promote lectures, to promote speakers, to promote the right website, to help people who edit lectures, advertising, anything he can do using his skills for Kiddush Hashem. There is endless profit that you can earn. There's no end to how much you can make with a little talent. Oh, a lot of people has it, but none of them use it almost to gain profit. They have it and they use it for nonsense. For stealing some song for some singer and making themselves a CD. Oh, I break into his website. I don't have to pay. All these kinds of things. What are you using? You, you came to the world to be a hacker, to do negative things. Here is a talent can be used. A doctor. How a doctor can be a righteous man. This is a doctor and this is a doctor. I'll give you an example. There is a doctor in Queens, New York, that is a dentist. One time I called him up. I said to him, listen, we have a yeshiva here in Monsi. More than 30, 40 baalei tshuva in average time. They constantly would transfer them to yeshivot in Israel after they grow. But you know, they don't have money. They come here, we give them food, a place to sleep. And eventually, sometimes they need uh, teeth, root canal, treatment. I want to send them to you. Would you take care of all their needs for free? Without one second hesitation, he said, absolutely. All of them. Now listen good. A person has a feeling. He comes to him. How much a feeling costs? I guess a hundred dollars, let's say. More? They raised it? <laughs> what, one fifty? Are you a dentist? No. Ah, okay. No. The cap is a thousand dollars. No, no, no. I know that. That I know. But uh, okay. So feeling two hundred. Okay. So now let's say feeling is two hundred. Now you come. A person that was embarrassed to say no. You ask him for a favor, and he was embarrassed. How would he do the job? Right away, finish the feeling. One, two, three. Quickly, as much as he can, because he has customers, and send him right back to yeshiva. No, just to get rid of it. Not him. He takes him before the other customers who pay. He make him like a king. He clean the teeth for him. He check if he needs other feeling. Don't leave. You need this, you need this, come next week. You need root canal, everything he does. 4,000. Braces. Thousands of dollars. Come, I have to put, make braces for you. You understand? A person has one skill. What does he know in his life? To fix teeth. It's a profession. Some people fix cars, some people fix teeth. You can make millions with that and gain no spirituality. You can do the same thing and gain billions of mitzvot. Why? Every one of these students go back to the yeshiva. Now he has a peace of mind to learn. You cannot learn when you have pain, root canal. You put some whiskey on your tooth, some arak. Maybe it's going to numb it for a few hours. You don't have the money. What can you do? So. Now he's going back, he's learning. Every page he learns, this dentist has a share in it. Because he made him able to learn. Psh, how long he worked? An hour, an hour a week, an hour a month, two hours a month, whatever it was. You know, usually they don't have that much cost from their pocket, even though he's very generous. But it really doesn't cost him that much. He gives his time. And what does he do? Gain fortune using his talent to the right thing. Sometimes a person, all he knows is to drive a car. That's it, no skills in his life. All he knows is to drive a car. So he thinks, what can I do with driving a car? He has no idea how much you can do with driving a car. 
No idea. You know how many volunteer jobs, how many helping chesed you can do with driving a car? Bottom line, even the dumbest person on earth has something that he's blessed with and can use it to gain spiritual profit. The problem is that people are not trained to think that way. They are not trained. What is the goal of the wealthy people in life? What's the goal of the wealthy people? To be investment experts in their life, but not in Wall Street. That's not important. They'll get the money with or without Wall Street. Hashem doesn't need Wall Street to send them their millions. If there was no Wall Street, they'll make their money in a different business. Hashem wants you to be a wealthy guy, you'll be a wealthy guy. So what is their job? To be a professional expert in investment, spiritual investment. You have to know how and when and how much to invest in spiritual causes. For instance, sometimes you see a person, they come to him and say, we need you to give $7,000 for Hanukkah party. What are we going to do? Buy 300 donuts, some bottles of wine, some fruits, catering, $7,000. Guys and girls come to the shul, make a party, eat. Some say bracha, some no. Mitzvah, $7,000. It could be the same scenario. A person come to him and say, I, have, I need $7,000 from you. What are you going to do with that? I make 7,000 DVD or MP3 with 25 hours of Torah. 7,000 pieces, $1 each. And I give it to 7,000 or 5,000 secular Jews, which about half of them would listen, and a large portion of them start to improve immediately. Kosher, tefillin, tzniut, all kinds of things, as some of the people here already influenced from the lecture, already promising to keep this and this and this. From what I heard it, it was already worth it for me to come. But this is peanuts. How many people were here? 300? How many of them would change? 50? Who knows? Hashem knows. That's peanuts. With the power of this CD, it can go to 50 hands, this $1 travel. I have 17 complete ballet tshuva from one video cassette that someone gave me $1,500 13 years ago. I made boxes of 50 video cassettes in each, started to give them out for free. That's before CDs, 13, 14 years ago. I gave one video cassette to a guy that originally is from Las Vegas. Him, his wife, three children are fully orthodox. His sister, her husband, three children, fully orthodox. His parents, fully orthodox. His uh, brother, his wife, and two children, 17 people, fully orthodox, for one dollar that this person gave, 1,500 he gave. The one dollar, I don't know what happened with the 1,499 other. This is just one dollar that I saw in my eyes what happened. 17 people became fully orthodox from this cassette. He went from, from one to another. One of them learning now in Israel, in Elad, in Yeshiva. He left America, moved with his family, learned Torah all day. This one dollar already brought more than billion mitzvot to the guy who wrote that check for $1,500. Why? Because this guy that learns, and his kids now in Talmud Torah in Elad, it's already three people who learn Torah full day. And Hafez Chaim calculated 600,000 mitzvot per day, if you learn, full day. Every letter is mitzvah. You know? So right away, it's more than almost 2 million mitzvot per day he gets. Multiplied by year, it's hundreds of millions. This is just that family. The other one that I told you is the first one, he already made five seminars in New York. <coughs> Two of them I had with Rabbi Amnon Yitzchak together, me and him. Hundreds of people. Many people became Balei Tshuva. This guy is already organizing seminaries. He started an organization called Mika Amcha Israel. He makes people put mezuzot, fill in. There's no end to how much that Jew that wrote that check is earning every minute. There's no end. And it's much important, much more important than money. If the wealthy people only had some sechel sometimes, a world would be a much better place to live in. But what are they doing? Sending millions to here, to Zimbabwe, to Africa. Why not your brothers at home? First, take care of your brothers, your cousin, your uncle, your neighbor, and then worry about the rest of the world. 
just like the other people over there, they have to worry on their own people first before they help us. It's just as fair. But nobody knows. Nobody use. If a person is talented in speaking, some people are very big in Torah, but they cannot say one speech. They don't have the talent of speech. They mumble, they get confused, they get excited, they, their blood pressure go up. I've seen people like this. But knowledge, you cannot find anyone like them. What's their job in life? To write books. Don't talk, you make damage. You have to write. Let people who know how to talk use your knowledge for their work. That their job is to talk to people. It's like an army. Every soldier has a job in the army. One cannot do the job of the other. One person is an officer working on computer. It's just as important to the army as a spy in Iran. Because with one without the other they cannot do anything. So the person has to focus on what he's good with. And that's what the, what the purpose of the life. What's the hardest for you and what you feel that you are talented and Hashem is pushing you to this direction. But the most important thing, and we will finish with that, is nothing in your life you will get before you would beg every minute of your life to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to light your eye and show you the right path. Even if Hashem puts you for a certain purpose, even if He needs you, He wants you to do a very important job in this world, He wants you to save thousands, but if you don't connect to Hashem and beg Him to show you the way, He won't show you the way, because this is a rule in the creation. Where do we learn it from? Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu, since he was a baby, was searching for that creator. He didn't know who he is, he didn't have Torah. We have Torah, we know how the world was created. Avraham didn't have knowledge. He grew up in a house of a, a, a father who owned a big electronic store, selling plasma TV, selling statues, all kinds of things, Machti Arabim, Terach. So obviously Avraham didn't get the right education. And still, he was searching, where is this creator, where? And Hashem gave him hard test, very hard test. And he didn't give up. And he was searching for the truth all his life. And what does Hashem say in the end? Atay adati. Now I know. Ki lokimata. And from that moment on, everything Avraham needs to do, Hashem showed him the way. What do you think? You just become religious, you put filin, you pray a little bit a day, and, you, and Hashem will light your eyes to show you where you have to go? No, my friend. You have to beg with tears to cry to Hashem to show you the way. Who will learn it from? King David. He was much smarter than all of us together, multiplied by a million. And what did he do every day? What did he do? Read Tehillim. Read with English that you understand what it says. What does it say over there? Half of the Tehillim is begging Hashem, show me the right way. Make me close to you. Show me what you want from me. Help me with my enemies. They don't let me do the right thing. Protect me. Make me close to you. That's all. What do you mean? You're already close to him. You have the spirit of, of Hashem on you. Doesn't matter. Every moment of his life. Help me. I need this. I need this. Connect me. Show me. Areli, amitecha. Show me your truth. Show me the truth. Most of the praying that people do, this is how it is. Imagine if we can connect some kind of a machine to someone's brain that read your mind. And then everybody can read on the wall what you asking for when you're praying. So this is how it looks. You have a big screen, it's running, words running. What? Millions of people now standing and praying all over the world, Filat Shachrit. What would be on the wall? One word. Say it loud. Parnasa, 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 with beard, without the beard, with yamaka, with white yamaka. Parnasa, 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 non-stop. It's the last thing that a person should ask for. There are so many things in life that are much more important than Parnasa because Parnasa, one way or the other, you get what you need to survive. Because if Hashem put you here, He's responsible not to let you starve to death. He doesn't have a choice. Otherwise, why He put you here? Just to starve, to die? No. Put you here for a job. 
And if you put, if you give someone a device and you want him to use the device, you have to give him the batteries. You don't give him the batteries, what are you giving him the device? Hashem has to give us and charge our batteries because he doesn't have a choice. He doesn't have to make us millionaires, but he will give us what we need because otherwise there's no point of the, of the tikkun, of the, of the test. So why are you worry so much about this? Just focus on the real important thing. One time I'm Rav Moshe Malka, is a tzaddik from Israel, he told me the big mistake that people make with Parnassah is that they ask for general parnasa and they want to close deal and they want to make, become wealthy, they want to make more millions, and they have good intention sometimes. He didn't tell me that, I'm adding. They really have good intention that they really want, if I make another five million, I'm going to open this and I'm going to support another yeshiva and I help the orphans. He has plans in his mind and sometimes it's really real. Most of the time is real, but when he gets the money, it just somehow doesn't happen. Something happened between the time that he requested the money until it got to his hand. When he was requesting the money, he really meant to give. You know, like the joke. One guy is driving and he's in a rush for a big business meeting and he can't find parking. Manhattan. It's hard. Say, Hashem, I'm begging you, if you find me parking, I promise you I accept every day I put fill in. Find me now the parking. I promise, all of a sudden he found parking. He said, Lo tzarich Hashem, I managed. I found. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, what happened here? You know, he said, don't ask for a lot of money from Hashem. You're allowed to ask for parnasa. This is what you have to say. Please give me the right parnasa that would make me close to you. I don't care what it is, a lot, a little, nothing. What would make me close to you and fulfill my mission in life? This is the panasa you give me. Why? Sometimes people ask for so much money, Hashem flooded them with money, and I don't want to tell you their end, what it was. The money destroyed them. Don't ask for a lot of money. Be a hero. Don't go after your desires. Just say to Hashem, you know what, here I declare in front of you. From now on, please just give me the exact amount in the right time that will help me at that scenario, that situation, to be as close as possible for me to you. That's it. That's the secret of the Parnassah. Not to ask for a lot. Why are you asking a lot? I have a plan. I want to open another yeshiva. I tell you something else. My uncle, Alav Shalom, he came to Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, which was the biggest Chacham in the world, and the biggest Kabbalist, and the biggest Anav in the world. <coughs> if you know who I'm talking about. Incredible, the stories that you hear about him from his students. It's hard to hear anywhere else. There's Baruch Hashem, hundreds of big Gdole Ador, and they're all huge and Chachamim. But he had something unique about him. Plus, he was full of suffering. He suffered, was on a wheelchair, all kinds of things. So my uncle came to him, we were still healthy. I said to him, Chacham, I'm about to retire from Amkor. You know Amkor? Yeah. Yes. Who knows Amkor? Yeah. Amkor is refrigerator. It's not, not in business. A long time, it was an Israeli, very primitive, ugly refrigerator. They're out of business, so you can sell a Shona Rabba. <laughs> they don't have enough Kamina anymore. But it was horrible, horrible refrigerator. But he was working in this company, and now he's about to retire, so he gets to get pension for like 40 years or 30 years that he was working. So he comes to him and says, Rabbi, I now live in Ramle. Ramle is next to the airport, not such a good place. Today it's mostly Arabs, Bichlal. the Arabs taking over. But in that time it wasn't Arabs, it was a poor city with some crime. So he said to him, now we became Baal Tshuva, all the family. And when I get the money, I want to move to Yerushalayim. The money I'm, getting, I'm soon getting in two months, it will be enough for half an apartment in Yerushalayim. Or I can buy myself finally a house of my own, fully paid in Ramle in the religious neighborhood, where there are religious people in Ramle in that time. What should I do? So guess what he answered him? No, one guess I give you. What did he answer him? 
I'll tell you. He said, come to me when you will have the money in your hand. Now, if you hear such a thing from a chacham, you're supposed to faint right away. <laughs> four years I work for this pension. Maybe you see that I'm not getting it. He gets very nervous. But my uncle, I, I don't know if he wasn't sharp or he didn't get the point. So he told him, Rabbi, what's the difference? I'm asking you a general question. Where is it better to live in Yerushalayim, to own half of the apartment and to pay mortgage? or to live in Ramle without a mortgage. Tell me this or this. He told him, I cannot answer you right now. But when you have the money in your hand, I will answer you. So he said to him, why? What's the difference if I have the money or not? I'm getting the money. He told him, right now it's not a question about halacha. So I don't have siyata dishmaya to tell you the truth right now. But when you will have the money, it will be a matter of life and death. Now, Allah, then Hashem will give me the answer. You hear what he told him? And I heard that story, I almost fainted. And I can prove to you that that person has all the time Ruach HaKodesh. Even though it's very rare in our days to have Ruach HaKodesh. What's the Ruach HaKodesh that he has? Ruach HaKodesh means like a vision, like a spirit of Hashem is on him constant. How? Everybody know that famous story when a bus driver, Chiloni, secular bus driver, drive the bus, and he saw a little girl running into the road in Yerushalayim, and he couldn't stop the bus, and he went over her and killed her instantly. And guess what? Not only such a tragedy, the tragedy became double when the mother of the girl sitting in the first row in the bus next to him. She, had, she was supposed to get off the, that bus. So the mother started to scream, fainting, all the bus. I don't have to tell you what happened there. And this poor driver, he would bang his head on the wall, crying. After a few hours, when people started to breathe, the wife, he told the wife, the, one, the mother, please forgive me, you saw in your own eyes that it wasn't my fault. She ran, she surprised me, she came between the cars. So she told him, Lakachta neshama, tachzir neshama. You took a soul, return the soul to Hashem. So he said to her, how can I return the soul? Well, I can revive the girl. He said, no, return your soul, it's lost. You return, I forgive you. He said, I promise you, you know, in a situation like this, I promise you, I swear, I'm becoming, I become religious. Okay, no problem. And he kept his word. Now, from the minute he... He accepted to be a tzaddik. Of course, they fired him from the bus sta station, uh, company. He cannot find a job. He's very depressed. He's not married. No parnasa. Nothing in his life. He's very, very confused and suffering. He comes to Chacham Ben Zion, Abba Shaul. He said to him, you have to leave Israel. You have to go to the exile and make sure every week to move from one place to another. Don't stay in the same place more than one week. <laughs> every week you must move to a new place. Until one day they will offer you a shiduch with a girl, you will see right away she's supposed to be your wife. You take her, you come back to Israel, and all your problems will be gone. <coughs> this is the story. How do I prove from this story that he has Ruach HaKodesh? Very simple. When you see a person that had such fear from Hashem, such love to Hashem, such love to the Torah, such perfect personality, such an amazing character that couldn't say a lie, couldn't put an act, none of these things that we sometimes get used to, he did not have it in his life. Over here in these stories, there's only two possibilities. Either he's the biggest chacham with a vision, or is the biggest rasha in the world, there's no in between. If he doesn't have siyata dishmaya from Hashem, he doesn't see, how does he ruin the life of this miserable Jew more than it's ruined already? Not only is suffering, is sending him now to live every week in a different place of the world, he destroyed his life. If you don't see, even ordinary people like us wouldn't have the guts to do it to a Jew to make him leave his hometown and go and move from one. It costs a lot of money. You have to move constantly, schlepping your stuff. It's a big hassle. And who knows, maybe this guy will never get married. He'll be in the exile because of me 40 years now. It's a very big risk. 
And that's what happened. He went for a few years, he met the girl, he came back to Yerushalayim, and I know the, st the story I know from, from close, not from stories in the newspapers, from people who were involved over there. Do you understand what level you can get to this world, in this world? You can get to such a level that you, don't have no, you cannot imagine. Just when you think you are exhausted and you did the maximum you can do today in Avodat Hashem, think again, you didn't even do 1% of what you can do. What's the proof? One time my cousin was very sick and he couldn't go to yeshiva to learn Gemara. He had headache, fever, so he was sleeping in his bed. He's not the type of the guys that when they're sick, they go and take advantage and sleep for three days. Drink and eat and that's it. No, he's sleeping in bed with the Gemara open and learning as usual. But he, he cannot. He scream in yeshiva, has a lot of noise. So he's resting, drinking some tea and learning Gemara in bed. Then after a few hours, the girl ran to the home. Abba, Abba! Pinchas fell and split his head open. It's all bleeding. So he jumped from the bed. He ran to the street. He saw his little boy. I think he was 10 years old, something like that. He's getting married in a few weeks, this boy today. The story was uh, about more than 10 years ago. He sees all his face is bleeding. He picked up the boy. They don't have a car. So he runs on the street looking for a cab or a ride until he found a ride. He got to the hospital. All that time he's holding the boy in his hand. And it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's heavy. Remember, he's very sick with fever. He came to the emergency room in the hospital, Adassa, whatever. They took care of the boy, standing there reading Tehillim that maybe he doesn't have something serious with his brain. After a few hours, finished, they made some stitches, they got the boy out, and he took him out, and then he said, why Hashem did this to me? Just when I thought today I'm dismissed from going to yeshiva, I did the maximum. I'm not guilty. Ma, I'm sick. Fever, no? If you had a million dollar deal today, you would call sick? If you had a hundred thousand dollars deal, you would call sick? If you had $5,000 deal, you would call sick? Probably not. If you had $200 deal, you also won't call sick. And I want everyone to know something very interesting here. In Olam Abba, in the next world, two Jews who do the same mitzvot do not get the same reward. We are not talking here a governmental check here, that everyone gets the same thing. Social security, the same percentage, finish. No. One Jew who learns one hour Torah and his friend who learns with him one hour Torah, they get a totally different reward. Depend who you are. You are determining your reward for everything you do based on your words and based on your behaving 100%. Why? I'll give you an example. If you learn Torah now, let's say you said that you learn every day until 12 noon and then you go to open your business and somebody comes and offers you a job now. I need help, I'm willing to pay $20 an hour. Come, come, you learn in another time. Come, I need, I need help, come help me. So you're thinking now, I have to learn two hours. Now I'm gonna go, it's gonna give me 40 bucks. I need money, I'm broke. So you're thinking, you say, okay, I'll come. Every hour of your Torah worth $20 in Shamaim. Hashem knows how to transfer it to spiritual pleasure, $20. If you say, no, no, I'm learning. Okay, I'll give you 30. No, I need you, come on, 30. No, 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 50. No, no, 100. 100? 200 bucks in two hours? Okay, fine. Get up. Is our worth $100? You determine what the Torah worth. That's what you get, Mida can neged Mida. Same thing when you judge another person with your words. I wish this person will get this and this and this because he's doing this and this and this. Tomorrow you have a test and you do the same scene and you get the punishment that you send for the other guy with your own mouth. Or when you're supposed to forgive somebody and if you don't, it's gonna get severely punished and you want revenge, so you don't forgive. Two or three years later, you're gonna come in the same scenario and you're gonna need forgiveness and you won't have it because it's all in life, midah keneged midah, measure for measure. And many of the people in this world they always have this thought in their mind, there is time until I'll be righteous. It's not rush. It's no rush. 
What? I'm only 70. It's plenty of time, huh? Hey, Shimon Perez is, wants to be the Prime Minister. He's 86. It's plans. You know? I know a guy, 70 years old. He told his son, I want to buy a few acres of land now to build some buildings to make a <laughs> He already worked 40, 50 million dollars, this guy. He's, you can see, hardly work. He's thinking now to buy acres of land, to buy apartments. <laughs> What's going on with you? Why don't you go with your cane, sit in yeshiva next to the chachamim from morning to night, drink your tea, drink a little chaim, hear words of wisdom, come to heaven holy. Not come to heaven while you're watching the workers in the construction. Come ready. Nobody thinks. What for? Okay, so you make another five million in a project. What is it gonna get you to? Why, where is it gonna bring you? Nobody thinks. No, more and more. So the Gemara says, If a Jew knows the truth today, today, Christmas Eve, 2012, what? Okay, we heard the great lectures, everything's fine, makes sense proving their points, the rabbis, no problem. I'm amazed, the Torah is amazing, I didn't know it's so nice, I didn't know it can be proven scientifically. Wow, I'm amazed. What's tomorrow morning? Breakfast, cheese and bacon. 20 years. Same thing, the usual. What happened three days in Toronto? What happened? That's it, just talking to the wall? This is what the Torah warned from. You know the truth today, and you say, hey, there's time, one day I'll be righteous. One day. When you really want to do it, your siyata dishmaya, your help from Hashem will be much, much lower. This is how it works, and I think we'll finish with that. What, until what time? The, what is the what next event? Five, five. Six, four, five. No, but it's 10 to 7. Until 7? Seven? Okay, so five minutes and we finish, and I'll give you a few five minutes to rest. What's for seven o'clock? What's over there? Dinner. Ah, dinner. Candle lighting. Candle lighting and dinner. Okay, good. All right, so shh, let's just finish this. You should know. When a person is 18 years old, he comes to a lecture, and he gets an opportunity to become Baal Tshuva today. He's young. First chance in life. If he grabs it, if he grabs it, he will have 100% assistance from God in everything he does and everything he touch. He will be very easy. Friends, invite him to a program, age, across the street from the hotel, all the Americans' friends from high school, from college, all of a sudden he meets friends, everyone together, it's much easier. Parents are all of a sudden agreeing, sending money, everything beautiful. First chance. Doesn't take it. Two years later, again, he came to a lecture or someone gave him a CD. Now he decided to do it. He doesn't get 100%, 90%. Less help. Then, third chance. Doesn't grab it. 70% help. Fourth chance, 50% help. Four, seven, ten times, 0% help. The Rambam writes something that mamash is really, really scary. It's not the Rambam, it's the Torah. But the Rambam brings it up. The worst punishment for the human being is that Hashem is lacking the gate of repentance in his face. Don't want you anymore. Goodbye. I waited enough for you. Now you'll do it on your own without my assistance. It's almost impossible on your own. How? How are you going to start? That's why the older the people get, the harder it is for them to become Baalei Tshuva. The younger they are, the easier it is. Why? Coincidence? No. The older they are, they had already their chances. Now in their 60, 70, whatever, it's much harder because they didn't take advantage four, five, ten times that they had, or 50 times. Only Hashem knows how many chances He gives to a person. Now when they want, in the best scenario, they become Shomer Shabbat, 
put filin in bed two minutes a day, eat kosher a little bit, that's it. That's mo- most of the people in this age. Very difficult for them to come, to learn, gemara, to write, you know. It's very difficult. You can't blame them in this age. It's very hard to start. And the little that they do is also very difficult for them. They really, really sacrifice. But if they did it 30 years ago, it would be a completely different. The way the choice of the person walk is as follow. Exactly like the GPS. I'm so glad that Hashem gave us this device GPS. <laughs> Instead of explaining for five years what the free choice concept is, all you have to tell a person, go and learn how to use the GPS. This is how the free choice work. So everyone asks, well, what do you mean? What's the connection? The connection is like this. A person has to get exit 12 to get off. He got to exit 12, this is his destination. Get off the exit, this is the very important meeting, a life-saving meeting. But he was busy on the phone, he almost fell asleep, and he missed the exit. And now he has to get off the next exit. But there's a problem now. As soon as he missed the exit 12, what happened to the GPS? Recalculating. <laughs> recalculating. The, if it's a good one, sometimes it remembers exit 19 to recalculate. <laughs> Depend what kind of GPS you have. Mine somehow always rebel against me. <laughs> I say, no, you fool, move already. We, we need to know we are at exit 14 already. No, it's frozen. Anyway, but if it's a good one, Hashem GPS is fantastic. It always works. So right away, recalculating, thousands of new possibilities are opening. But they're not as good as the first original one. What is it like? A person is 20 years old. They say to him, Miriam or Rachel. Rachel, beautiful girl, good family, very wealthy parents, no irat shamayim whatsoever. No modesty, no kdusha. Religion by her is a hobby. It's not a way of life. But beautiful, from very respectable family, you don't have to work, you don't have to worry. <coughs> Rachel, however, not so pretty. Average. Father is not rich, but very big tzadika. Teilim, un- um, honesty, modesty, chesed, wants her husband to learn Torah. He's thinking now, what should I take, the beauty or the righteous? Thinking. And he say, I'll go with Miriam, the beauty. So he went with the beauty and the money. 20 years later, you see what happened with his GPS. When he took Miriam, all the path changed. If he take Rachel, there's one path directly to Ponovich, one directly to Mir. One directly to here. When he took her, all the path changed. One, 47th Street. One, I don't want to say names, not to offend anyone. Over here, this market, the vegetable market, the real estate office, the, the ways are different. Why? She wants money. Kadima, wow. I came from a rich house. I don't want to live this kind of life. 20 years later, you see the difference. A choice of today, 20 years later, is completely changing his life. Over here is a businessman hardly coming to shul once a week if he gets up on time. And, you know, still have ponytail, leather, these jeans, holes in his pants. But it's Shomer Shabbat. But that's it. His kids, of course, all of them of the derech. None of them is religious. Has Shalom, some of them will marry Goyim. Why? When did it happen? That moment that you chose her and not her, that's when it all came to you. Not 20 years later, it's already in the system now. Why? Because from here there's no other way. You take her, 20 years later you're Rosh Yeshiva, you have 600 students, all of them tzaddikim, 100%, your kids, everything is different in your life. You're not a millionaire, but you're a billionaire in mitzvot, yes? Rabbi, why couldn't Rachel, the rich, beautiful one, become righteous, or study and learn, and become just as good as her? That's what tshuva is. Now let me explain you what tshuva is. Chazal say, tshuva was created before the world was created. Why? Tshuva could not be created when the world was already here. It had to be before the laws of nature. Why? Because it's against the law of nature. What does chazal mean by that? Chazal means like this. If a person gets on the wrong highway, now it's... uh, 
When we came here, we made the wrong turn. 17 miles we have to drive to the opposite direction. So what's happening now? Now you're in, that's it, there's no way out. You only can go straight. And you know you're going to the opposite direction. You have to come back the whole way. So when a person enters that way, really there's no turns. Tshuva means that Hashem pick up your car or yourself from this aisle, pick you up from this highway, taking you like this to a different highway with the opposite direction and make you a huge shortcut in your life. This is tshuva, it's against logic. Because a person didn't pay his bills 20 years, one the electric company sent him a huge bill, so he comes to the president of the electric company and say, hey, Mr. Smith, listen, I'm gonna give you now uh, uh, my word. From now on, every bill you send me, I pay that day. I don't want you to give me one day credit. But what happened until now, $20 million, this bill, forget about it. Let's wipe it out and start fresh. What's gonna happen? Bankruptcy. He's gonna send him his hitman tomorrow to kill for his chutzpah. <laughs> nobody will ever agree. No judge, no, nobody. Harvey. But this is what Hashem is doing. Hashem is taking a person and saying, okay, you wanna start new with me? Let's go. Take you from this mud, put you in a different place, and you start from there. So the same thing with this girl. Of course, if she makes tshuva, I will change the whole thing. So the GPS will recalculate again. But who, who knows, maybe not. What are the odds? What are the odds? You're right, things that are surprises in life. But we are obligated to take what is certain, not what is maybe. The Gemara says, Bari veshema, Bari adif. 100% or 50%. You must take the 100%. I always tell my students, when someone comes to ask for tzedakah from you, you don't know who he is, don't be impressed by his beard. Don't. We heard many stories of people who put custom to take tzedakah. Do not be impressed. If you know it's a rabbi, you know him, you know he has yeshiva, you know his kosher, invest by him. You have someone you don't know who he is, give him one dollar, thank you very much, goodbye. Why? Why to give one everything and the other one almost nothing? Because the one that you give everything, you know him. You know what he does. And you know where your money is going to. But the other one you don't know, it's 50-50. Maybe he's honest, maybe he's a crook. Who wants to invest in money with a 50% chance to lose everything? What, am I Mr. Nice Guy? Because I don't want to... To, to give one guy everything and the other one nothing? No, that's not my job in life. I have to worry about myself. If I do not think about my future, my eternal future, nobody will do it for me. Not my kids, not my parents, not my wife, not my best friend, no one. You're responsible for what you cook and you're going to, have to eat it in the end. Baruch Hashem, here, song. To finish, it's like commercial on the radio, you know? <laughs> when you speak on the radio, they want to shut your mouth. So they start playing the music. Baruch Hashem, I got the point. And, and, and it's exactly what we say. So Be'ezrat Hashem, thank you for sitting so long, all day. Thank you very much.